and we will see. Mataji says, give me a minute. I will just start. Not this. right now. You can just have it ready. When I want to, we will pull it up. I just, I just want to give you a heads up that that's the verse I'll be quoting. Okay, so thank you all dear devotees for joining this call. Today is a very, very special day. It's the appearance of the Lord in his form as Lord Ramachandra. The Lord in this form comes to display exemplary behavior. In this form, he is known as Maryada, Pur uh, Mar Maryada Purush. And he comes as the ideal son, the ideal husband, the ideal father, the ideal king, the ideal uh, upholder of religious principles, and uh, teaches us the principles of religion by his exemplary behavior in all circumstances at all times. So therefore, even two million years later, we are still talking about Lord Ram. <laughs> and we will continue to talk about the Lord because he is all famous, all strength, all beauty, all wisdom, all knowledge, all renunciation. And that is why he is Bhagavan, full of the six opulences. So Lord Ramachandra was uh, the Lord, Supreme Lord himself who came and to this earth planet for a very specific reason. At that time, the earth was being harassed by hordes of Rakshasas headed by the 10 headed demon Rakshasa known as Ravan. Now, Ravan was an extremely powerful Rakshasa. He had 10 heads and 20 arms. And it seemed as though no one could stand in front of him. He had received so many boons that he was almost invincible. But of course, no mortal can be invincible, however powerful he or she is. And this proves that ultimately the Lord is the supreme and he can overcome anyone. So let's go back a little bit to a very interesting chapter in the Earth's history. What was happening was this 10 headed demon was creating so much havoc. He was plaguing the Earth plaguing the sages and the rishis who were peacefully performing their yagnas. His rakshasha hordes would just descend on them and defile and pollute the whole sacrificial arena. They would then fall upon the rishis and tear them limb to limb and gobble them up just like food because the rakshasas are man-eaters. And this way they would not allow the performance of sacrifices to the gods. The gods were also very much uh, aggrieved because this powerful Rakshisha could overcome them. He had performed so many austerities and he had received so many boons that he could not be killed by anyone. But he did not bother to ask protection against humans and animals because he considered them too puny, too little to worry about. It was beneath his dignity to ask for any protection from them because he considered himself very, very powerful. And he was, he was very powerful because he was the son of a sage, Vishrava. And his mother was an asura or a demoness called Kaikeshi. So very interesting how this union happened. It is because Kaikeshi, the demoness's father was Sumali. Now Sumali wanted a very powerful son to be born to Kaikeshi so that the Rakshashal race could continue nicely. And so he rejected everybody and he was looking for the most powerful person who could actually be the consort of Kaikeshi. And then he chose Vishrava. Now, who is Vishrava? He is actually the son of Kulastya Muni, who is one of the Sapta Rishis. So an extremely powerful sage was married to Kaikeshi. And the result of their union was this demon Rakshasha called Ravan. Actually, who is Ravan? He is Jai and Vijay, one of the doorkeepers of Lord Vishnu, who were cursed to come to this earth planet as enemies of Lord Vishnu. That's a very interesting story. And the Lord, uh, when he was in his uh, Vaikuntha, the four Kumaras came. And because Jai and Vijay could not recognize these great personalities, they saw them as small little children because they were just sages who look like little five-year-old children. So they said, you cannot go inside. 
So the Kumaras were very insulted and they said, they cursed Jay and Vijay, said, you do not understand who we are. You go down to earth planet <laughs> and take birth there and get purified. You're not fit to be over here. So having received this curse, Jay and Vijay were, you know, they didn't want to leave by Kunta. They didn't want to leave the Lord. And Lord came out to see what was going on. And when he saw that they were cursed, said, all right, you can take seven birds as just normal humans and devotees of mine, or you take birth as demons so that I can have some fighting pastime because the Lord likes to fight. But in the Vaikuntha planets, who will fight with the Lord? No one. <laughs> but he likes to fight once in a while. And so they said, my dear Lord, we want to come back soon. If it means we have to be your enemies for three births, so be it. And so they fall down to the earth planet from the heavenly, from the spiritual world. And first birth they take is as Hiranyaksha and Hiranyakashipu. Then after that in Treta Yuk, they come as Ravan and his brother Kumbhakarna. And then after that in Krishna Leela, they come as Shishupal and Dantavakra. So he is a very, very powerful personality. Ravan is a very powerful personality. And because of his birth, he's also actually very learned. He learned all the Vedas from his father. It is said that he was an expert Veena player. And you will find it very interesting that some say he was an expert in astrology. In fact, some say that he wrote uh, Ravan Samhita, a treatise on astrology. And he was very well known in the marsh, very uh, well versed in also the martial arts. He was also trained as a Kshatriya. And because of his mystic powers, being a demon, he could change his form at will. He could change into a mendicant, which is how he fooled Mother Sita. He could change into any form, whatever he liked because of his mystic powers. So he was an extremely powerful personality and he even challenged the demigods. In fact, he went and fought with Kuber, his brother, his half-brother actually, because Vishrava had Kuber by, by, uh, by another wife, Ila Vida was her name. And she was not, uh, she was uh, uh, a celestial lady. So Kuber was a demigod who was the treasurer of the demigods. And he had a wonderful vahana called Pushpa Vimana. It was like a floating city and it could move anywhere simply by the will, by the thought of the person driving that chariot. It wasn't a chariot in terms of wheels and you know it didn't have an engine and a motor. It was a celestial chariot, which was beautiful. It has lakes and gardens and palaces and emeralds and corals. And it was just a beautiful thing to behold. And it floated everywhere and it flew at the speed of the mind to wherever the person who was in the chariot wanted. So what did Ravan do? He defeated his brother. He grabbed the chariot. And now he was roaming around, you know, looking for fun. What do demons do for fun? They harass other people. <laughs> so everywhere he saw sages peacefully doing some yagya, peacefully doing some sacrifice, he would go there and he would release all his rakshashas to go and terrorize them and then eat them up. This was his sport. He did it for fun. Another thing he did for fun was to harass women. So it's very interesting how he got cursed because this time when he tried to harass this lady, she was deep in austerities and she was none other than Vedavati. She was meditating. She was the daughter of a sage and she was meditating for the Lord to be her husband, Vishnu to be her husband. So Ravan made a very grave mistake. Though he tried to harass her, he couldn't do anything. She had great mystic powers. And so the moment he went to grab her hair, with her hand and her mystic powers, she just cut her hair as though her hand is a knife. She released herself and she cursed him saying, you have defiled this body. So immediately I'm going to annihilate it. And because you have harassed a woman, you will die through a woman. And so she produced flames from within her own body, reduced her body to ashes. And Ravan is just standing there wondering what's happened. She was a very powerful mystic and a sage, but her words became the reason why Mother Sita became the cause of his death because she cursed him. Another woman also cursed him. You know who? Parvati. 
Ravan wouldn't sit still after finishing that. He wanted to harass somebody else. So he was going on his chariot and he reached all the way to Mount Kailash. And then Nandi stopped him. You cannot go any further. This is the abode of Lord Shiva. You cannot move any further from here. Turn back and go. So Ravan says, what do I care for Shiva or anyone? I will do what I like. I will move this mountain and I will keep going. So what he does? He digs his 10 arms into the sides of the mountain and tries to lift it up. And the, the mountain shakes violently and Parvati is, you know, just jolted by that movement. And so she starts, you know, shouting out, what is going on? And Shiva immediately says, do not worry, my dear wife. This is this vain demon Rakshasha, Ravana. I will settle him in no time. You don't worry. So Parvati is very angry. Who has dared to disturb her Lord Shiva and herself on Mount Kailash? So he says, who is this wretch? Because he has frightened a woman, his death will take place at the hands of a woman. So that's another curse he gets. And this time from Mother Parvati. What does Shiva do? He just presses his toe down on the mountain and all his 20, uh, all his 10 arms, everything is now trapped because the mountain comes down on him and his hands are deep inside the mountain. So he's completely trapped. All his ministers start telling him, this is Lord Shiva, he's very powerful. You cannot mess with him. Now start offering prayers and start offering appeasement to him so that he will release you from this. For 100 celestial years, Ravan is offering prayers to Lord Shiva. And finally, Lord Shiva becomes pleased with his austerities, pleased with his prayers, and releases the pressure, and he's able to take off his arms. The Pushpa Vimana is standing there waiting because he's the, he's the owner of that chariot. All this time, it is in the sky waiting for him. So finally, he's released. He offers prayers to Lord Shiva and he says, my dear Lord, please, if you are really pleased with me, please give me your weapon. So Shiva smiles and gives him his Pashupata weapon and says, so be it. And he disappears from there. So now Ravan has another powerful weapon of Lord Shiva with him, but he has also got so many curses. <laughs> then what happens? Because he's a demon, his nature is demoniac. Again, the same spirit is there to go and find someone else to harass. So this time, as he's looking down from his vimana, he sees Ayodhya. At that time, Ayodhya was being ruled by a great forefather of Lord Ram called Anaranya. Now, this king was a very, very powerful king and very brave, but he was no match for the demons. Remember, the demons could change their forms at will. So every time these human soldiers would come to attack them, they would become invisible. And they would fly into the air and the soldiers would be looking here and there to find where they are. They would fall behind them. They would jump on them from behind and then they would finish them off. So in the end, only King Anaranya was left on the battlefield and he was facing the demon very courageously. But of course he was no match. And finally, uh, Ravan could overcome him. And as he was dying, Ravan decided to curse, not curse him so much as, you know, make fun of him. He started making a mockery. Oh, what kind of a king are you? What kind of ancestors you have? And so on. So Anaranya says, right now I am dying, but that is not because... So, because the time will come when you will soon die at the hands of someone in my race that you are deriding now. So he got another curse. And that is why Lord Ramchandra came in that same race, Raghu, uh, Raghu Vamsha, Surya Vamsha dynasty of the kings of Ayodhya. So Anaranya is actually a forefather of Lord Ram. And so he also curses the demon Ravana. So he is getting curse upon curse upon curse because of his... Uh, you know, violent, aggressive behavior towards others. And so then, finally, he doesn't pay any attention. He doesn't care about human beings. He thinks they're too puny and too useless for, you know, bothering with. So he decides, okay, time enough. I've had enough fun over here. I'm going back to Lanka. So he goes back to Lanka, which is actually a golden city. It was actually the city of Kuber. And again, by conquering Kuber, Ravan began ruling this golden city of Lanka. Meanwhile, 
on the earth planet many many centuries had passed and now king dashrath was ruling the kingdom of ayodhya dashrath was an exemplary ruler and the subjects were very happy with his rule the rains were plentiful grains were plentiful everyone was happy everyone was at peace because the ruler was father and would take care of his citizens like they were his own children ayodhya had, had beautiful parks beautiful lakes full of swans full of lotuses the elephants would spray perfumed water on the streets and keep them clean and and scented beautifully guests were received very nicely there was plenty of fruits fruit orchards vegetables grains gold silver jewelry the ladies were all decorated beautifully the men were well versed in all the different arts all the four varnas and ashrams were flourishing because everyone knew the purpose of life which is self realization which is to go back home back to godhead and so all the four varnas the brahmanas the kshatriyas the vaishyas the shudras all were performing their duties very nicely it was not this disorganized society that we have today where no one knows what is to be done what is not to be done no one understands the purpose of the human form of life and as for exemplary behavior forget about it <laughs> it doesn't exist that's why lord ram's kingdom was known as ram rajya it was very very wonderful you know we we may not even understand what kind of rulership there was in those times i'm going to read out this description just to tell you how wonderful was the late reign of lord ram during the late reign of lord ram no one within his kingdom suffered from any diseases or any mental disturbance everyone was very happy and prosperous they had no fear of thieves no fear of hunger no fear of scarcity all the towns and villages were filled with abundant food grains fruits vegetables and milk products the people were experiencing the same degree of piety and happiness that was exhibited during satya yuga there were no natural calamities such as floods earthquakes droughts pandemics covids <laughs> war nothing like that was there all the women are very chaste and they never have to suffer the pain of widowhood lord ramchandra will rule the earth for 11000 years before returning to his supreme abode in the spiritual sky vaikuntha so this was how the kingdom was you know beautifully being run by dashrath but he had one anxiety he had no sons he was now growing old and he was worried how will my line continue this is the famous line of maharaj ikshvaku and without any heir to continue the kingdom how will i be able to leave my body in peace so he became extremely anxious and concerned and started consulting his ministers what should i do now how will this race continue should i perform some yagyas should i perform some sacrifices to please the gods and so vashishta muni who was his chief sage and minister said yes we should perform the sacrifice he decided to do the ashwamedha yagya we heard about that yesterday guru maharaj told us after that that was followed by the putreshti yagya which is specifically for sons and a very interesting dialogue takes place in the heavenly planets because now the gods are beginning to ask brahma do something dashrath is performing a sacrifice please call upon the lord to advent himself so that some person who is capable of dealing with this demon rakshasa will take birth and they knew only the supreme lord can do that so i'm going to read out this also this is very beautiful past time the celestial smoke from the offering sanctified by vedic mantras rose upwards to the skies and was received by the gods with the universal creator brahma at their head they personally assembled in the sky about dashrath sacrificial compound unseen by everyone the gods began to address lord brahma what did they start pleading to brahma they said because of a boon granted by you o lord brahma the king of the rakshasas ravan is constantly harassing us and is extremely difficult to overpower having begged from you that he be made invincible to us 
as well as to practically all other created beings, this evil-minded one now seeks to overthrow us. He profanes even great saints and has no regard for anyone at all. Brahma was concerned that his boon to Ravan had created so many problems. So he listened as Indra, on behalf of the gods, was making this prayer. He said, Ravan sought invincibility, but he did not ask for immunity against humans, whom he considered of no consequence. Thus his death must come at the hands of a human. Please, therefore, beseech the Lord to appear as Dashrath's son. So Brahma agrees. And he starts praying to Lord Vishnu, and <clears throat> immediately the Lord appears. He appears on his beautiful eagle carrier Garur. And his beautiful body is blackish, and he shines with a brilliant luster. He's wearing a yellow silk dhoti with a garland of blue lotuses, and bright celestial gems are around his neck. And he's adorned with beautiful gold ornaments and jewels. And in his four hands, what is he holding? A conch shell, a mace, a discus weapon, that is the Sudarshan chakra, and a lotus flower. And he comes, and then Brahma addresses him. Oh Lord, here is the worthy Dashrath praying for a son. All the world are afflicted by the evil Rakshasha demon Ravana, who must be slain by a man. Therefore, be pleased to take birth as Dashrath's son. Appearing in a human form, please dispatch this Ravana in an encounter and save the world from their suffering. So what does Vishnu, Lord Vishnu say? He spoke reassuringly in a voice deep like the rumbling of thunder clouds. Oh gods, give up your fear. Along with my expansions, I shall soon be born as the four sons of Dashrath. I myself shall appear as his eldest son and my personal weapons will incarnate as my brothers. After annihilating Ravan and his demon hordes, I will remain on the mortal plane, ruling the globe for 11,000 years. And after saying that, Lord Vishnu immediately disappears. But the gods feel very satisfied and happy that their prayers are answered. And here on the earth planet, from the sacrificial fire, a wonderful dark being comes and he's holding a golden pot of payasam, that is sweet rice milk and kheer and sweet rice. And he offers that to King Dashrath. And he says, give this to your queens and your purpose will be fulfilled. And so King Dashrath, he gives half of it to Kaushalya, his principal queen. He gives one fourth to Kaikeyi, his favorite queen. And then he gives one eighth of the one fourth left to Sumitra. And then he gives again one eighth to Sumitra. So therefore she has twin sons. Shatrugna and uh, Bharat, and uh, I'm sorry, Lakshman, Lakshman. And uh, Kaike gives birth to Bharat, and Kaushalya, of course, gives birth to Lord Ram. And that happens in this today, Lord Ram Navami. Why Navami? Because on the ninth day of the waxing moon today, Navami, it's called Navami, in the month of Chaitra, the Lord took birth in Ayodhya. And he's so beautiful and he's such a sweet child that he enchants everybody in the palace. Everyone's pet son becomes Ram. He's so beloved that all his other mothers also, they are very fond of Ram. Kaike is very fond of Ram. Sumitra is very fond of Ram. In fact, the whole palace and all the citizens were very fond of Ram. Why? Because he's the Supreme Lord. And his attributes are very, very wonderful. So when Narad Muni was asked to describe Lord Ram, this is his description. You want to hear? You ready? Lord Ram has appeared in the dynasty of Ikshvaku as the son of Maharaj Dashrath. He is the embodiment of all good qualities. He is the reservoir of opulence and he is the master of unlimited potencies. His mighty arms extend to his knees. His throat is decorated with three lines like on a conch shell. His shoulders and chest are very broad. His head is beautifully formed and his eyes are large. His complexion is tinged with green and is very lustrous. His stature is medium tall and his limbs are symmetrical and well formed. His intelligence is unfathomable. His countenance is grave. 
and his speech is deep in tone and very eloquent. Lord Ram is fully conversant with the use of weapons. He possesses absolute knowledge of the Vedas. He is the ideal follower of religious principles, and he is the upholder of the Varnashram Dharma social system. He is the destroyer of all foes and the only shelter for all surrendered souls. He possesses unflinching determination. He is a genius with an unfailing memory. He is wise, compassionate, and grave like the ocean. Lord Ram is heroic in battle, loved by all creatures, and impartial towards friends and enemies. And we see this when Vibhishana came to him and surrendered, the Lord immediately accepted him, though he was an Asura, he was a demon, not an Asura, he was a Rakshasha actually, because he was the brother of Ravan, but he was a great devotee of Lord Ram. So when Vibhishan surrendered to Ram, Ram accepted him. In fortitude, Lord Ram is like the Himalayas. In prowess, he is like Lord Vishnu. His beauty surpasses that of the full moon. His forbearance is like that of earth. His anger resembles the fire that blazes forth at the time of universal devastation. He is the very support of the entire universe and he's an expansion of Lord Vishnu. Actually, he's the Lord himself. So we can see how powerful Lord Ram is and how his advent brought about a change in the world's history because now Lord Ram dispatched all the Rakshasha warriors. He began at the age of 16 by accompanying Vishwamitra into the forest and killing the demons. Hmm, not killing, but uh, Maricha. He killed Subahu, who was an uncle of Ravan, and he sent Maricha flying into the ocean with one arrow, and Maricha gave up all his demonly uh, misadventures because of that. He said, oh, Ram, Ram, no, no, no more. So he became a retired demon. <laughs> he decided no more, <laughs> no more harassing the sages. I'm going to live in a cave and live peacefully. So Maricha actually gave up his uh, demoniac activities and actually began to perform tapasya and penances in a forest. He got so terrified of what had happened to him because of Ram's arrow. He said, this Ram is very powerful. I do not want to do anything to incur his wrath again. And so he started actually becoming a good sage in the, in the forest. But Ravan wouldn't leave him alone. He came to him and told him, you become a deer and you uh, entice Sita away. And at first, Maricha was shocked. He couldn't believe that Ravan is asking him to fight against. He said, you don't know who Ram is. The very word Ram, just Ra, strikes terror into my heart. He says, after that episode where he flung me into the ocean, I could have so easily been killed. I live in terror of Ram. Everywhere in this forest, every tree, because he wears tree bark, everywhere I just see Ram and my heart trembles every time at the thought of Ram. I'm so frightened of him. So you don't know who you are against, Ravan. You have so many beautiful wives. Just stay happy with that. Why do you want to run after more, more, more? Just stay put and be happy with what you have. But Ravan being, you know, a demon and a lusty demon wouldn't listen to good advice. Marita tells him, that when you receive this kind of advice from a so-called friend, he's actually your enemy. Whoever gave you this plan doesn't know who is Ram and only will bring about your demise. So give up this plan. The Ravan says, you either die today at my hands or you follow what I say and die at Ram's hands. Because he knew if he went as a, in the form of a deer to entice Mother Sita, he will be killed by Ram. And then finally, Maricha realizes his death is coming one way or the other. He says, it's better to die at the hands of Lord Ram than to be killed by you. So I will go along with your plan. He knew. So therefore, Marita goes in the form of a deer, entices Mother Sita. And we all know the story of how Ravan comes in the form of a sage and entices Mother Sita away. And then he takes her off to Lanka. On the way to Tayu, a very old vulture, who is actually a devotee of Lord Ram, tries to stop him because he sees that Mother Sita is being carried away by this demon and he puts up a very heroic fight, very heroic fight for an old vulture. He really causes great uh, difficulty to uh, Ravan and Ravan is baffled. How is this old vulture able to stop me? 
And finally, he asked Jadayu, what is the source of your strength? Now, in those days, people told the truth, even to an enemy. And so Jatayu said, why should I tell you? He said, I will tell you the source of my strength if you tell me the source of yours. So Jatayu, believing, told him, my strength is in my wings. But that was a trick from the demon Ravana. He had no intention of telling him that his secret of immortality is in his navel. And so the moment he heard, he took a sword and locked off Jatayu's wings. And so the poor bird fluttered to the ground and he knew his end was near. And so he started saying the word Ram, 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 because he wanted somehow or the other, he knew that Ram and Lakshman would come rushing through the forest and he kept his life heirs going simply in order to tell Ram what had happened. He had actually no strength left because so much blood was pouring out of his body but he kept his life as going by simply uttering Ram, Ram, Ram. And sure enough, after some time, Ram and Lakshman came crashing through the forest looking for Mother Sita. And at that time, Jatayu told him what had happened. He said, I tried my level best to stop this demon, but I could not succeed. I am so sorry. But then Lord Ram said, you are glorious because you have done what, you know, what Dharma says, you know, you do the right thing, no matter how difficult it is. And so, they say that he may have materially not succeeded, but spiritually he succeeded because he took the name of Lord Ram and died and went back to the spiritual world doing a wonderful thing, which was to try to save Mother Sita. So that's the story of Jatayu that comes in uh, uh, Ramayana. So Ramayana is full of so many different adventures, you know, heroism in battle, so many unlikely heroes, and so many unlikely allies becoming friends and assistants to Lord Ram. Now, it's very interesting that the demigods are all told to take birth as monkeys. Because remember, we said that Ravan had immunity from everybody except humans and animals. So all the demigods took birth as monkeys. They were actually very powerful demigods. They were not monkeys. They were just in, human, in that form as monkeys but they were extremely powerful demigods. So that's a Hanuman, Vali, Sugriv, all of them. They were actually sons of Vayu, sons of uh, the different demigods. And they took birth in order to assist Lord Ram in his quest to find Mother Sita. And there's the beautiful story of how Lord Ram and the monkey army crossed over by building a stone bridge. Have you ever heard of a stone floating on water? Is it ever possible? But see, Lord Ram did the impossible. Why? Because he's the Lord. And the monkeys, they just did what the Lord wanted them to do. And they were simply saying, Ram, Ram, Ram. They were writing the name of Ram on the stones and then flinging them into the water and the stones stayed afloat. And in five days flat, they had built a bridge that was 800 miles long and uh, 10 yojanas, that is... Uh, 100 yojanas is 800 miles and 10 yojanas wide. So 80 miles wide. And the monkey army went across to Lanka and then fought against Ravan's forces one by one by one. Meghnad, Indrajit, all the sons and all the brothers. Even Kumbhakarna was killed. Now Kumbhakarna was a demon who was so powerful, so huge, that he would just grab humans in his hand by the fistful, like how he would grab nuts or something and gobble them up, eat them, crunch them, and that was the end of it. That was how huge he was. Humans were like tiny little, you know, pieces of vegetable practically for him. So he was so powerful that the demigods knew if this man is around, we are in trouble. So when uh, Ravana was performing, remember he was performing great austerities and boons, and so he was asking Kumbhakarna, you know, you asked for a boon from Brahma. The demigods knew if this man asked for a, this Rakshasha asked for a boon to make him even more powerful, they are in big trouble. So they prayed and implored to Brahma, do something. So he sent Mother Saraswati to sit on the tongue of Kumbhakarna when he's asking for the boon. And from his mouth, you know what came out? I pray for the boon to go to sleep. <laughs> And that was Mother Saraswati. <laughs> she made him say that. And immediately Brahma said, so be it, tatastu, like that. 
And Ravana was aghast. How can you give him a boon like that? Please, please, please modify it. So Brahma said, well, I've already given the boon that he wanted. The only way I can modify it is he's allowed to be awake for one day in the entire year to eat something. But if he is woken up untimely, that will be the day of his death. So Kumbhakarna just went to sleep. He was sleeping all year round. And one day in the year, he was woken up. And guess what was his food? Huge, huge caves full of human flesh, goat flesh, pig flesh, elephant flesh. That was his food. And great, big, big, huge barrels full of blood. That was his drink. So this is what food he was given every once in a year. And then he went right back to sleep. But the battle was becoming extremely difficult for Ravan to manage. And he knew without Kumbhakarna's help, he's not going to be able to defeat the Vanara army. So what did he do? He said, wake him up. They all said, but it's untimely. He said, doesn't matter, wake him up. We need his help. And so they banged on drums and they did all kinds of things, but nothing would wake him up. Finally, they realized that the smell of all that food that he normally eats, if it goes into his nostril, that will wake him up. And so they brought all that food, which he normally, you know, pails and barrels full of blood and flesh and everything. And when he started inhaling all that, his normal diet, <laughs> then the demon woke up. He said, oh, it's, is it time for me to eat? And they said, no, no, it's time for you to fight. So then Kumbhakarna comes like a huge mountain on the battlefield. And then, you know, he starts, he picks up fistfuls of monkeys and starts eating them like how we would eat uh, peanuts, you know. And they're crushing them with his huge, you know, feet and everything. And then they realize the Vanar army is, you know, so terrified, they all take to their heels. But then Lakshman, because he is powerful, he shoots an arrow and that's the end of Kumbhakarna. So now the scene is set. Ravan has nobody left. He has to come out and fight in battle against Ram. And that battle is a very wonderful pastime. You know, everybody is just riveted at the way the Ravan and Ram are fighting. They are just, you know, he's very powerful. The Lord is also very powerful. And every time Lord Ram shoots an arrow and knocks off his head, another head grows in his place. And Ram has about 100 heads of Ravan lying around. And he's thinking, what is this? I'm not able to kill this demon. What is the secret? And then Vibhishan comes and tells him, my dear Lord, his immortality lies in his navel. So you have to shoot an arrow into his abdomen and then you can take his life. So then finally, Lord Ram, realizing that that's where he should shoot the arrow, he takes that arrow, that special arrow, which was given to him by Vishwamitra, shoots that arrow right into the abdomen of Ravan. And that's the end of Ravan. That's the end of fit in the demon. And of course, everyone is rejoicing and saying, long live Lord Ram. Finally, the scourge of the earth is gone, finished. And all the sages and the hermits and the whole earth actually is rejoicing because of the reign of terror that Ravan had unleashed was so much that the burden of the earth had become too much. And therefore, the Lord kept his word. And now we'll go to those two verses, Riddha. Paritranaya sadhunam vinashaya chadusvitam dharma samstarpa narthaya sambhavami yuge yuge. To deliver the pious, to annihilate the mis... I myself, and to reestablish the principles of religion, I myself appear millennium after millennium. So the uh, Lord, all the... Yeah. Bhagavad Gita? 4-7, right? 4-7 and 4-8. Four seven is yada yada hi dharmasya lanir bhavati bharata abhyutthanam adharmasya tadatmanam shrijam yaham. Whenever and wherever there's a decline in religious practice, O oh descendant of Bharat, and a predominant rise of irreligion, at that time I descend myself. So Krishna, you know, he doesn't just throw us in this material world and say, good luck, <laughs> tough luck, you got yourself into this mess. I'm forgetting you. No, Krishna is always taking care, even though we have rebelled against him, left the spiritual world and come here trying to lord it over material nature. The Lord never forgets us. As a loving father, never forgets his children. He's always trying to remind us of our eternal home and our real nature. 
which is to be loving servants of Krishna. We are the ones who have rebelled against God and we have come, we have fallen from grace and come here to this material world. And now by understanding the real nature of who we are, we are eternal spirit souls, eternally servants of God, Krishna. And our only duty is to get back to our eternal duty of loving Krishna and serving Krishna and going back home so that we can get out of this endless cycle of repeated birth and death and old age and diseases and death, which we have done millions and millions of times. But now having come to transcendental knowledge, a person of intelligence starts thinking, what can I do to go back home where I can have eternal life, eternal joy, eternal peace of loving Krishna and no longer subjected to the material torments of all these things. Now we can see around us, look at this Ukraine war, look at all this COVID pandemic business, look at all the mayhem that is happening. That is because the sinful activities in this world have increased enormously. We are killing mother cow, we are killing babies in the womb, we are doing anything we want, regardless of the consequences, because we think we can. But there's always a price to pay because the laws of God as Srila Prabhupada reminds us, are so stringent that nobody can escape from the reaction that comes from it. And so there's this mass reaction in the form of COVID, forest fires, droughts, hurricanes, wars, pestilence, all this is described in Srimad Bhagavatam as a direct, direct result of the sinful activities of the citizens of this world. People are in the darkness of ignorance. They do not know what they are doing. And so therefore, the Lord has come to reestablish the principles of religion. You might say, what is happening? Where is the Lord now? But the Lord has come in the form of Bhagavad Gita, in the form of Srimad Bhagavatam. In fact, when Krishna left the earth planet, he spoke the Bhagavad Gita 5,000 years ago. And in that, he said, this disciplic succession was broken. And so I'm speaking these words again to you, O Arjuna. He had actually spoken the words of the Gita to Vivaswan, the sun god, 120 million years ago. But he spoke it again 5,000 years ago because the disciplic succession had been broken. And so Krishna has given us the Bhagavad Gita, where right, right in the beginning, in the second chapter, he's telling Arjuna, you're not this body, you're eternal spirit soul. Come to real knowledge, wake up to who you are and come back home by performing your duty. What does Arjuna want to do? He wants to renounce. I'll go into the forest. I don't want this war. I'm not going to fight. I'm giving up all this. Because he's overcome by compassion and kindness and mercifulness. For what? For the bodies of his cousins, uncles, grandfathers, etc. He feels very sad that he has to kill them. And so he says, no, no, I want to spare them. Let them live. I don't want the kingdom. I don't want anything. And then Krishna enlightens him and tells him that this is not about you. <laughs> this is about what I want. <laughs> I want to annihilate the demoniac Kauravas because they are causing so much problems on Mother Earth. And I want to reestablish righteous rule because he wanted Yudhishthir, who was a righteous ruler, to rule the Earth. So that's how Krishna also came. Again, for the same reason. To annihilate the miscreants, to deliver the pious, to reestablish the principles of religion, I myself appear millennium after millennium. So we celebrate Ram Nami as a very special day when the Lord comes in the form of Ramachandra. And even today, his glories are sung not just in India, but in so many parts of Southeast Asia, Thailand, Burma, Singapore. In fact, I'm told that Singapore airport, they have uh, pictures and dioramas of demigods, especially the Amrit Manthan, you know, that uh, where the churning of nectar from the demigods. They have Brahma uh, statuettes. So uh, Vedic culture had spread all over the world. In fact, the whole world was one, one uh, kingdom at one point. That's why it's called Bharat Varsha. And then slowly, little by little, all the changes happened because of Kali Yuga, individual wars, so many different branches and people you know, changing uh, and moving away from Vedic culture. Actually, all the earth was one planet, one ruler. Ayodhya was the capital, Maharaj Dashrath, then Lord Ram, then King Bharat, like that. So Lord Ram's appearance, Ram Navmi, Srila Prabhupada instructed, is a very important day 
it must be celebrated just like Janmashtami or Gaur Purnima. And so we, um, we take great joy in uh, relating the pastime of the Lord's appearance. We remind ourselves that Dharma Samsthapanathaya, reestablish the principles of religion, become exemplary in our thoughts, in our words, in our behavior. Because remember, we are practicing to go back home, back to Godhead. So as we become more and more expert in the service of the Lord, we will become qualified to go back to Krishna by remembering Krishna, by remembering Ram at the time of death. And uh, Srila Prabhupada said that Hare Krishna, Hare Rama, you know, people call it the Hare Krishna, Hare Rama. There's Lord Ram in the Mahamantra also. You can take it as Lord Ramachandra. You can take that as Lord Balaram. You can take that as... Uh, Krishna in his form as uh, Ra, um, Radhika Raman. Raman. That's right, Raman. Thank you. Thank you, Vrinda. So, Lord Ram is there in the Mahamantra. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, 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 Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, 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 Hare Hare. Such a beautiful, powerful mantra, which has all the names of God, Krishna and Rama. And Hare is Bhagavad Radha. In the vocative, it be, Hara becomes Hare. And what is this prayer? My dear Lord, please engage me in your service. Please help me to remember who I really am. I am not man, woman, Indian, American, Chinese, Christian, doctor, engineer. These are all external designations by virtue of whatever birth we have taken. But that is just an external dress. What are we inside? We are eternal spirit souls. And our eternal identity is loving servant of Krishna. We may change our bodies. We may put on a different dress. Tomorrow I may be born as a man somewhere in China. Does that change who I am inside? No, I'm still a servant of Krishna. And therefore, Srila Prabhupada has given us a real United Nations. You can see all over the world, other people may be fighting and quarreling, but Krishna's devotees are uniting. You saw the stories of how Ukrainian refugees and people who are fleeing, how they received such love and such care and shelter at every stop on the way whether they were Polish devotees or Russian devotees or any devotees, every temple welcomed them, gave them shelter, gave them food. food. And the grateful devotees were saying, Srila Prabhupada has given us our real family, the family of devotees, because we know we are not these bodies. And what about this quarreling and fighting? And, you know, this is all nonsense. This is animalistic behavior. In olden days, wars were fought on the basic of, basis of religious principles in order to establish the supremacy of the Lord. But today's wars are fought out of lust and greed. Only you usurp someone's property. It's not religious. It is like cat and dog fighting, you know, that's all. Like a jungle. I am mightier, so I will prey on someone weaker and more vulnerable. This is just animalistic behavior. This is not war. This is not a religious war. This is a war based on lust and greed. And therefore, Srila Prabhupada also warned us that as long as we are killing mother cow, the repercussion will be your sons will be sent to be slaughtered on the battlefields. So all these people who are being slaughtered is just a reaction to all the cow killing, all the abortions that people are indulging in. So the nature will take care by sending our <laughs> children because when we do indulge in these sinful, heinous acts, such as imagine killing mother cow, she's our mother. She gives us milk, right? From birth to old age, we are dependent on her for milk, yogurt, buttermilk, ghee. Uh, all the milk products are coming from her and systematic organized slaughterhouses to kill mother cow. What is the reaction to that? The, uh, the, the scriptures describe that one who kills mother cow will have to go to the hellish world. And for every hair on mother cow's body that he has killed, he will have to take birth again and again and be killed himself. So we can only expect more of all these calamities because people's sins are increasing. But devotees are unfazed. We just chant Hare Krishna and we want to go home to Krishna. That's all. <laughs> so thank you all for listening very patiently to this pastime of Lord Ram. 
It is relevant today and will be for time immemorial because the Lord's pastimes are eternal and are always taking place. Actually, we cannot forget Hanuman. You know, Hanuman is a great devotee of the Lord and he is the epitome of excellence in service to Lord Ram. His birth is also very, very special. They say when the payasam was given to uh, Dasharath, a wonderful eagle came, snatched a little bit of that payasam and flew away. And you know what? That eagle was Garuda. And he gave that payasam to Anjani. She was meditating in the region of Kishkinda for a powerful son. And she was actually a female monkey married to a monkey king known as Keshari. Who was, and she herself was a celestial maiden who was cursed to come down to the earth as a, as a monkey queen. And so the eagle gave her that payasam and she took that payasam and that's how Hanuman was born. And actually this uh, payasam is, uh, is, you know, coming from this uh, sacrifice, but also he's an energy of Lord Shiva. Because Shiva and Parvati also wanted to take part in the pastime of the Lord. They also became monkeys. They transformed themselves into monkeys. And because they are husband and wife, they joined in union. And the powerful uh, semen of Lord Shiva was then carried by Vayu and kept safely with the seven rishis, Sapta rishis, who then brought it in the form of... Uh, on, who placed it on a metal leaf, the description goes. And finally, Keshari and um, Anjani received this and Hanuman was born. So he's very, very powerful. He has, he's the son of the wind god also is the description. He has the power of Shiva also. And he's a great devotee of Lord Ram. So Ram's um, pastimes cannot take place without the mention of Hanuman, how devoted he is. Every moment, he's only thinking how to please Lord Ram, how to please Lord Ram, how to please Mother Sita. Once he asked Mother Sita, why do you put this red Sindur? She said, because Lord Ram likes very much if I put Sindur, that's why I put Sindur in my hair length. He said, oh, so Lord Ram likes the Sindur. How much he will like me? So he put Sindur all over his body and became red. <laughs> That's how they say that Lord, uh, uh, that Hanuman ji in many temples, he's covered with that reddish color. It's because of that pastime. He was so devoted to pleasing Lord Ram under any circumstance. And Lord Ram was so pleased with his uh, heroic feats of going to Lanka, jumping across, finding Mother Sita, bringing news of her. And then when Lakshman was unconscious in battle, he flew across and he picked up that whole mountain of herbs and came back to revive Lakshman. And Sam said, I can, I have nothing to repay you except my embrace. And we have that beautiful picture immortalized for all time of Lord Ram embracing Hanuman, which is a very rare boon that doesn't even come to Mother Lakshmi. They say that the Lord very rarely embraces anyone, but he embraced Hanuman and gave him that gift. So Hanuman's uh, glories uh, must always be remembered when we remember Lord, Lord's pastimes. And because he's so devoted to Lord Ram, he said, I will continue to be on earth and I will continue to extol your glories. In fact, they say wherever Ram Leela is going on, Hanuman comes there to listen to the glories of his Lord and Master Ram. So we can pray to Lord Hanuman because he's so devoted that please give us a little drop of your devotion to the Lord so we can also become great servants of the Lord and regain our eternal identity, our eternal position in the spiritual world. So thank you very much <laughs> for listening to this rather long narration. Um, we can now open up, I think, for questions, comments, discussion. It would be nice to see everyone. Hare Krishna, Master Ji. Thank you so much for this beautiful pastimes and narrations of Lord Ram. Uh, I think on this auspicious day, that's what I can do the best. I can listen to the stories and meditate on it and just visualize the pastimes. So thank you so much for that. Uh, I request devotees, if there are any questions, comments, realizations, please go ahead. Thank you, Vrinda. Thank you so much. My humble obeisances to all the Vaishnavas. 
and I humbly pray for your blessings that I may be able to continue to serve you all nicely and uh, delight you with more and more pastimes of the Lord. <laughs> Hi, Poshi Devi. Thank you very, very much for this wonderful lecture. It was beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you, Devi. We, we cannot see you. Can you tilt your uh, laptop just a little bit so that we can see you? Uh, now we can see you a little more. Uh, there you are. Happy Ram Nami to you, my dear God sister. Hare Thank Krishna. you so much. That was such a beautiful lecture. <laughs> Thank you. I'm so happy that you enjoyed it and uh, you're happy with it. Please bless me so that I can do more seva. You're already blessed with that, uh, that wonderful lecture. <laughs> Thank you. Mataji, I just have a small question. Like, whenever you read Ramayan, um, which edition you uh, refer to? Is it Valmiki Ramayan or uh, there is another Ramayan also? Right? Valmiki Ramayan is the best. There's also Kambi's Narayan, uh, Ramayan. He's, uh, Kambi is uh, South Indian, I think. And someone has translated it. I think it's in Tamil. I don't have that translation. I have only Valmiki's Ramayan. And uh, I like to read the one by Krishna Dharma Prabhu. Okay. It is actually, it's also on the Veda base. It's uh, uploaded on the Veda base. So I read that one. There's also one uh, Valmiki Ramayan. I read the pastimes, some of the pastimes today, which I read. It's in this one. It is told by Purya Pagnya Das. This is, uh, this is the book also I refer to. Okay. Ramayan. It is retold by Purna Pragna Das. Valmiki is Ramayana. Is it Purna Pragya Das? Yeah, Purna Pragna Das. Okay. <clears throat> and he entitles it Valmiki is Ramayana. It is by Sri Sri Sita Ram Seva Trust. Okay. He's a, he's a disciple of Srila Prabhupada. Okay. Thank you. I recall a little bit here also. There is also um, Valmiki's Ramayan. Uh, the whole thing, I think, has been published by Gita Press also. Volume 1, 2, 3. It's a very big, very heavy. Mm. It's three big volumes. Mm. Yes. I have that also. Yes. Okay. My father gifted it to me <laughs> because I wanted it. So I have read that also. It's very nice. Mm. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Swaha. Happy uh, Ram Navmi to you, too. She has sent a message on the chat. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Mataji. His excellent humble obeisances. Glories to Shri Prabhupada. All glories to Guru Maharaj. Uh, uh, Amrita, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. All glories to Agurudev. Happy Ram Navmi to you. Thank you. Happy Ram Navmi to you and to all the devotees. Um, Mataji, I had a question. Um, what is the difference between the uh, Valmiki Ramayan and the Ramayan written by Tulsidas? I don't know so much about uh, Tulsidas Ramayan. Srila Prabhupada didn't really want us to read Tulsidas Ramayan. There is something about Tulsidas Ramayan that he objected to. I think little impersonalism is there in that. So Srila Prabhupada wanted us to read Valmiki Ramayan. Okay, Mataji. Uh, thank you. Welcome. Devotees, are there any more questions or comments? I see Samya Dhatri, my god sister from Ljana is online. Swaha from Dublin, Ireland is online. Kita Kiti from Mayapur is there. Namrata is there. 
Namrata, you're in Mira Road, right? Yes, Mother Lee. Okay. And then Rinda, you're all the way in uh, North Carolina? Uh, I'm in Baltimore, Mataji. Oh, you're in Baltimore. Okay. Here we yeah. have. Here. <laughs> and then we have my dad from uh, Navi Mumbai Nerul joining us too. Uh, uh, Prabhuji, would you like to say something? Dad, she's asking you, do you want to say something? It was a wonderful well, performance and I'm, I think I also forgot so many things. You helped me to recall them. And all the best to you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Prabhuji. <laughs> uh, please keep giving your association, Prabhuji. It is so nice to have you. <laughs> My dad has two names of Krishna and Ram together. His name is Vasudev Ram Chandra Rao. Imagine. <laughs> That's wonderful. <laughs> yeah, so fortunate, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> no wonder you are there. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm very blessed because both my parents, uh, you know, their lineage is that they have been three, four hundred years, they have been following Madhvacharya and worshipping Udupi Shri Krishna. My grandfathers on both sides were great devotees of the Lord, maternal and paternal. So I feel very blessed that uh, somehow this rascal took birth in this family. <laughs> oh, Mataji, I, I was just... Uh, uh, this, this is just... Uh, a question, I would like a suggestion from you. One of the uh, person told me that before you read Bhagavatam or before you try to know Krishna, you should read Rama and you should try to know Ram. So I, I, I was just contemplating on that and I just want your, uh, uh, you know, review. What, what you, what can you say on this? Well, Srila Prabhupada never gave us this instruction, so I wouldn't want to say that this is what you should do, because Srila Prabhupada wants us to know Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Krishna is to Bhagavan Swayam. Krishna is the origin of all the incarnations. Ram, Narasimha, Varaha, Matsya, Purma, you name it. He has innumerable incarnations, but Krishna is the origin, and so Srila Prabhupada always told us about Krishna, and then all these are you know, manifestations of the Lord. So, Srila Prabhupada never gave this instruction that first you read Rama and then only you can read. He wanted us actually to read all the books, but uh, he wants us to worship Krishna. In fact, life should be so molded in, uh, go to that particular verse uh, 1865 of Bhagavad Gita purport where Srila Prabhupada clearly mentions Krishna, Krishna, Krishna again and again. He says life should be so molded that 24 hours we should be thinking of Krishna. Can you pull up that purport for us, uh, Vrinda? I would like to read that purport just to put your mind at rest regarding this particular question that you asked. In Bhagavad Gita 1865, Krishna uh, says, always think of me, become my devotee. Worship me and offer your homage unto me. Thus you will come to me without fail. I promise you this because you are my very dear friend. And in this purport, how Srila Prabhupada is saying, just see. The most confidential part of knowledge is that one should become a pure devotee of Krishna and always think of him and act for him. One should not become an official meditator. Life should be so molded that one will always have the chance to think of Krishna. One should always act in such a way that all of his daily, daily activities are in connection with Krishna. He should arrange his life in such a way that throughout the 24 hours, he cannot but think of Krishna. And the Lord's promise is that anyone who is in such pure Krishna consciousness will certainly return to the abode of Krishna 
where he will be engaged in the association of Krishna face to face. So everyone who follows this path can become a dear friend to Krishna, obtain the same perfection at Arjun. And here he says, these words stress that one should concentrate his mind upon Krishna, the very form with two hands carrying a flute, the bluish boy with a beautiful face and peacock feathers in his hair. Then one should fix his mind on the original form of Godhead Krishna. One should not even divert his attention to other forms of the Lord. The Lord has multi forms such as Vishnu, Nara, and Ram, Varaha, etc. But a devotee should concentrate his mind on the form that was present before Arjuna. Concentration of the mind on the form of Krishna constitutes the most confidential part of knowledge. And this is disclosed to Arjuna because Arjuna is the most dear friend of Krishna's. So you see how much Srila Prabhupada wants us to remember Krishna. He says, you have to become Krishnaized, nothing but Krishna. <laughs> So, of course, we, we glorify the Lord in his various, we do Narsima Jayanti, we do Narsima Chaturdashi, we do, you know, uh, when the Lord appears in his different incarnations, we glorify all the past, but we think of Krishna all the time. Is that all right? Yes, Madhija, I think this line clarifies uh, 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 that you should not... Um, meditate on other forms of Krishna, which is uh, there. Yeah, this, this clarifies. I was just uh, contemplating because uh, the per that person was uh, telling that uh, Krishna is a little complicated to understand and Ram is a little easier to understand. So you should, yeah. uh, you should uh, read Ramayan first before, you know, jumping on to uh, reading Krishna. Right. But yeah. Somehow, People like Ram because he is so exemplary. He never did any trickery, but Krishna is tricky. He plays tricks and he does all kinds of things. <laughs> Krishna can do anything. He is God. And whatever he does is perfect. It's absolute and it's beneficial to everyone. It may seem as though he's being partial to his devotees or he's doing something, you know, which is uh, questionable. But in every action of God, there's always good for everyone. It seemed as though he was on the side of uh, Arjuna, but the Kauravas got the benefit of going back to the spiritual world simply because they saw the Lord on the battlefield before dying. So he's benedicting them also. So you see, Krishna is all perfect. So people don't like Krishna because he is multifaceted. And he is difficult to understand. That is true. No one can understand Krishna. He himself says that. I know all beings, but me, no one knows. So therefore, they say, because Ram is exemplary, he's above board, he's above reproach, he does everything perfectly, he's always following the principles of religion. But Krishna, he breaks his word because he loves his devotee. He said, I will not take up any weapons. I will not fight on the battlefield. But when he saw his dear devotee Arjuna almost going to be killed, he picks up the chariot wheel and goes to fight Bhishma. Right? So Krishna is willing to break his word to protect his devotee. So Krishna does things that are difficult for people to understand. And that's why they, they prefer Ram. Yes, Mataji, uh, some people have uh, their natural inclination, like some have their natural inclination towards Krishna, but some people do have natural inclination towards Vishnu or Rama. Ram, Rama is very prominent. That's, that's, that, and very that's people. fine because each of us have our Ishtadev, you know, whom we love to worship, the Lord in our heart, you know, whom we love to worship. And that's fine. Some people will be Ram Bhaktas, like how Lord Chaitanya said to Murari Gupta, you are Hanuman. Because Lord Chaitanya told him, you should worship Krishna. And what did Murari Gupta try to do? He went home and he said, okay, this is the Lord's order. I have to worship Krishna. But all night, he was in such anxiety, he couldn't sleep. Because he could not displace Ram from his heart. He tried, but he couldn't. And next morning, he thought, I must commit suicide because I cannot follow the order of Lord Chaitanya. So he goes back to Lord Chaitanya and says, I cannot follow your order. Let me give up my life. 
And the Lord says, of course you cannot because you are Hanuman. You cannot dislodge Ram from your heart. And he gives him the name Ram Das. <laughs> and that's fine. You know, if someone is a deeply in love with Lord Ram, they want to worship Lord Ram, we don't disturb them. Let them worship the form of the Lord that they want to worship. But because Srila Prabhupada has given us this instruction, we as Krishna devotees, we try to follow this instruction. In um, the journey home, Radhanath Maharaj writes about his experiences coming on Gauras Ram Bhaktas. And I don't know if you have read that book, Journey Home by Radhanath Swami. And in that, he also is with that group of Ram Bhaktas. And finally, one person, you know, their head, somebody tells, this person is not a Ram Bhakta. He's a Krishna Bhakta. We have to let him go. You know that part in the Journey Home, Radhanath Maharaj's book? Maybe you have read it. Yeah. So in that, they tell Radhanath Maharaj, you are not Ram Bhakta. <laughs> you are Krishna Bhakta. So the Lord in the heart knows whom we love. And he accepts worship in whatever form we want to worship him. Each soul has a very unique relationship with God, you know, which is very special. So if someone is a Ram Bhakta, someone is a Narsimha Dev Bhakta, someone is uh, worshipping the Lord in Kurma Avatar form, whatever it is, they have formed that attachment, they have formed that relationship. So we don't disturb that. Thank you, Mataji. Uh, I feel so. There is some problem with the uh, internet uh, on the side of Namrata. I'm just guessing that. Hmm. Yeah, maybe she will okay. get that. Huh? I'm asking Namrata, is that all right? Mataji, my net is fluctuating. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Mataji, my net is fluctuating. Uh, I, I have almost uh, got your answer. Thank you for the answer. Thank you for the elaborated answer. Thank you very much. Welcome. Uh, Mataji, one small question I have. I was like, sure. uh, uh, so who is uh, Lord Hanuman in Krishna Leela? Or he was not in the Krishna Leela? No, he comes as a Bhima. They say okay. Hanuman in Ram Leela, he's Bhima in Krishna Leela, and then later he comes as Madhvacharya. Okay, okay. The description is there that he's Madhvacharya after that, and he's, you know, Madhvacharya is also very, very powerful. He put his toe on the ground, and uh, one very powerful wrestler, you know, challenged him if you're so powerful, I'll fight with you. And Madhvacharya said, all right, first try to lift my toe from the ground. And he just put his toe on the ground and that person couldn't budge that toe of Madhvacharya. He was that powerful. Because mm -hmm. he's, he's very, very powerful. They also described Madhvacharya as fighting a tiger and killing the tiger because he was attacking his disciple. <laughs> so very powerful. Madhvacharya was extremely known for his physical prowess also apart from his great scholarly and spiritual powers. Thank you, Mataji. Welcome. Are there any more questions, comments, or realizations? Ram Lakshman Janaki, Jai Bolo Hanumaniki. <laughs> <laughs> there are songs glorifying both Ram and Krishna. In our South Indian tradition, I remember my mother singing so many devotional songs, you know, and one particular song, it glorifies both uh, Krishna and Ram. You want to hear it? Yeah, sure. Ram Namo, Ram Namo, Ram Namo, Jaya Krishna Namo, Ram Namo, Ram Namo. Ram Namo Jaya Krishna Namo Dasharatha Nandana Ram Namo Devaki Nandana Krishna Namo Ram Namo Ram Namo Ram Namo Jaya Krishna Namo 
like that there are more and more description you know ayodhya vasi raman namo gokula vasi krishna namo then you know comes uh, mardana krishna namo then ravana mardana that means they kill ravan like that descriptions about the lord and very beautiful narration and the chorus is the same ram namo ram namo ram namo jaya krishna namo ram namo ram namo ram namo jaya krishna namo like that that's a refrain thank you mata ji that was beautiful <laughs> welcome okay so if there are no more comments questions or realizations then with your permission shall we end the call here mata ji sure i'm happy to be of service to you and i pray to be of more service to you because it's so delightful just remembering the past times of the lord and all his devotees is so wonderful we can spend hours like this and feel delighted and happy and satisfied because the satisfaction that the heart gets from recalling the past times of the lord we don't get this happiness anywhere else so this is very satisfying to the heart very pleasing to the heart and uh, soul food as we say <laughs> yes and like i said this is the best thing we can do on such auspicious days okay <clears throat> that's true listen and meditate on the lord by listening to their stories thank you so much mata ji once again for this wonderful class and for all the narrations and past times of lord ram and i look forward for your association again in future uh, thank you so much uh, i pay my obeisances to all the devotees vancha kalpataru yash kalpataru yash kripa sindhu bhayavacha patita naam pavane bhyo vaishnave bhyo namo namaha ananta koti vaishnava obeisances श्रीलाप्रभुपाद रामनवमी हरे कृष्णा हरे राम सीताराम हनुमान जी की जय हरे कृष्णा